Cool. All right. Welcome back to session number three of the workshop. Um, yeah. So we sort of rushed over a little bit last week. So, oh, thank you. Oh, and me. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we'll just go over again the um, the stuff on the rotor angle. Um, so we have uh, the yeah. So first off, quarter string coders. We have two essentially just like square waves out of, that are 90 degrees out of phase. And depending on the order that the pulses arrive at, you can determine which direction the rotor is turning. So if you get, uh, in this case, if you get uh, a rising edge on A before a rising edge on B, you know it's going one way. And if you get a rising edge on B before you get a rising edge on A, it must be turning the other. Um, you can also use the time between the transitions. So the time between a rising edge on B and a rising edge on A, um, that tell, that you can convert that into a speed, like right? so it's moving a set angle in, in a given duration. You know that time quite accurately. Um, so yes, so essentially the way we determine the position of the rotor angle is we, um, there are on, on these AMT10s, there are 1,024 pulses per revolution. That, that counts both, both for the A and B line, right? And that means there's 8,192 edges per revolution, an edge being a low to high or a high to low transition. Um, so if we want to, um, now because on the, uh, on the drive motors, there are seven electrical cycles in one mechanical revolution. If we want to, and, and we're measuring the mechanical position of the rotor. So if we want to convert that into an electrical position, we need to mu multiply by seven. So this equation down the bottom here, um, right down the bottom, we multiply it by seven for drive um, or for the pivot motors, which are much bigger, there are 22 um, electrical cycles per mechanical cycle. Um, so we would multiply by 22 in that case. Um, and then we modulo 8192, so that gives us the remainder. And then we bit shift it to the left because we uh, by three, because this 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 part here gives us a a number from one, zero to 8191, which is a 12 bit number. Uh, sorry, uh, 14 bit number, yeah, no, 13, 13 bit number, sorry, yeah, and then we bit shift to the left by three, and that gives us a 16 bit number, what we want. Um, so in this case, in the, the and then we cast it to a assigned integer, right? So, so this number that we port, in, we pump into this struct that XGC creates, this number is a number from negative 16,000, whatever, to positive 16,000. Um, or negative seven FFF x the positive seven, roughly. Um, cool. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Is that that all understandable. Sweet. Cool. Um, now the zeroing the rotor is a little bit confusing, um, but essentially what happens is when the BLCMDs first turn on, um, this um, this line here, right, this this forced mode line gets pulled high. Um, and that and and that that function in this microchip block is is to energize one of the coils essentially. So it pulls it pulls the rotor to be aligned with that with that singular coil. Um, so it aligns it to some known datum, and then we say, okay, that's zero. Uh, so we clear the position in in the in the position variable, um, and that's how we essentially that's how we zero the rotor. So when when we first turn on the rover, all of the motors will be energized to one position. And then, and then they all get that, that register gets cleared. So then, from there, as we increment or decrement the, the pulse counter, the position of the rotor gets gets uh, increased or decreased depending on on um, on the quadrature readings. Um, but we know what the actual angle of the motor is. Um, so uh, we zero here. We are zeroing both the electric. More or less, the mechanical position, like. So, like, if you think about it, if you if you zero, if you turned it on and zeroed it, the the motor would snap to the closest electrical cycle at zero, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But then, so then, if you turned everything off and then rotated the motor by, like, I don't know, by a seventh of a revolution, right? Mm -hmm. And then turned it back on again, it wouldn't snap back to the same spot. It would snap back to the closest yes. there, right? So, so you're not going to get, so it won't it won't zero to the same mechanical position every time. Yes. Um, but it will it will zero to the same electrical. Mm -hmm. And do we uh, do we not care that it doesn't zero to the same mechanical? Um, yeah. So we don't. 
the the drive obviously for the drive motors it trivially doesn't matter right? yeah. it doesn't matter now for the pivot motors they will zero to some random position effectively but then the position so later on we get to the position controller the position controller will then drive them to the correct mm -hmm. output position remember this is the position on the input of the gearbox right mm -hmm. so it's the it's the motor whereas the position controller on the pivots runs on the output position mm -hmm. So the resolver how we find into the picture yet. We're not there yet. Yep, exactly right. Um oh, so Taj, let me know if you can't hear anyone on Zoom. Um you're my man on Zoom. No. All good. Cool. Uh but yeah, please please do because um it makes the recording really hard to understand. Um cool. All right. Now this is a bit a bit detailed, but it's kind of helpful to know. Um, these are all the configuration registers for the QEI interface or the quota drink data interface on the on the pick. Um, the reason I've written these out here is because there's no MCC for the quota interface. So you have to do it all manually. Um, good news is I sort of copied a lot of it from the from the CMDs, um, but it doesn't completely like there's some things that have changed. Oops. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, so yeah, essentially you can see I've, I've literally listed every register and commented what it does. Um, and yeah, the the important ones are, so there's, we put it into, there's, where's the mode? Yeah, so this pi mod equals six. This is this is mode six of the quota stream space. And what mode six means is that it will increment the counter, um, but when, when the, the rotation when when that counter for the position right when that counter reaches a certain value it will reset to zero mm -hmm. and if it goes below zero it will reset back to the maximum mm -hmm. value right so it sort of wraps around mm -hmm. um and that's important because if the blcmd is spinning and it reaches 8191 we want it to go back to zero on the next one and not go to 8192 i mean mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter but it but it makes things easier so you can see and then these these qei lech uh all of, all of these and the, and the GECH. So, so these are the low and high bit bytes of, sorry, low and high two, I think it's two bytes each of, of, of each of the registers. So, so QEI, LEC, L and LECH are the, are two 16 bit halves of one number, right? Mm -hmm. So you can set that, that, that max threshold, um, oh, sorry, that minimum threshold to be any 32 bit number. Um, and similarly for, GECL and GECH, that's the maximum threshold, so greater, greater something. Um, so we set it, you see that we set it to 8,191. We leave the, that, the high bytes zero because we don't, we're only looking for a, a 12 bit number, not a 32 bit number. Does that make sense? Could you explain the context of uh, what, what uh, are we setting the registers inside the line of CV chip? No, no, these are, sorry, these are inside the pick. Um, so I don't know, to be honest, the line receiver being highlighted there is probably not helpful. I'm just pointing out that that's what it is, but this slide is actually entirely about the QEI interface that's inside. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also set, so this VEL, VEL1 CNT, that's the, um, the speed. Yeah, so that's a register that, um, counts how many pulses there are, how many how many clock cycles there have been between the last edge on the on the um, on the QEI signal and the next edge. So that 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 time, right? Um, but the VEL, I think the VEL one CNT is actually um, I, you have to check the data sheet. Always look at the data sheet for this stuff. But pretty sure that register is signed. So if if it's if it's if the motor is spinning one way, they'll give you a positive speed. If it's spinning the other way, they'll give you a negative speed. Mm. Cool. Uh, lastly, is this really weird stuff? This built-in write up con zero stuff. Um, essentially, when you want to mm, change the so so inside the pick, there's there's like the the little module that connects all of these uh, all of these systems inside the pick to the output pins, right? Mm. And to, and that's called the peripheral pin select PPS. Um, and in order to unlock that, you need to set this RPCon 11 register to be zero. And to do that, you use this function. Um, the, this function is is provided, it does a whole lot of stuff, um, but yeah, you do it that way, then you set these bits and then you um, then you uh, lock the PPS by setting, by, by doing that. Here. Um, 
essentially. Um, don't need to worry too much about the details, but that is something if you want to change, if, you, if you're doing a QEI interface on a future board, this configuration is really, really important. Um, and depending on the pick you use, it changes. So have a look. If you're doing this, have a look at this exact code that's on the CMBs as well, because it is subtly different. Um, and it took me a while to figure out how this actually works. Um, that makes sense. And everyone, does everyone understand the line receiver as well? Yep. What, uh, in what sense? Like what it does? I haven't explained it today. I, I think I explained it last week. Oh. Essentially, the line receiver is the opposite of the line driver, right? Uh, so it takes two mirror image, mirror image signals and subtracts them from each other and gives you, uh, yeah, gives you the subtraction and it's used to re to eliminate noise, noise that is on both lines. And what is it? What does it do with that? Does it send on another? And, and then it outputs that signal to the picture. Yeah. Yeah. So it's essentially it takes two wires and, and subtracts them and puts them into one wire and that goes to the picture. So why does that sound? Uh, it has a lot of pins because the, the encoder also has an index pulse, which we don't use, but you could use. And the index pulse, um, you can see, you see this commented line here. That's actually mapping the index pulse, which, which we've commented out because we don't care. Um, the index pulse pulses once per revolution. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to, you could use that to reset the encoder as oh, well. Yeah. Kind of. The problem is, it's a, little, it's a little bit hard to explain, but but you would understand in the context you're working on it. The problem is, is when you zero, the encoder isn't necessarily aligned with the index pulse, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. So it says this is zero, and then it moves a little bit, and it hits the index pulse, and then it goes, okay, this is zero now, right? But that's not true. Mm -hmm. So if you did it like that, you would have to like save the offset between the index pulse and the um, and the home position, mm -hmm. which you can do. You just got to be, uh, yeah, you just got to be smart about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and that is a feature that we probably should implement because at the moment, um, there's no way so. Say hypothetically there was like noise on the encoder lines and you'll and it just like miss it occasionally misses a pulse or there's like a random extra pulse that gets inserted. Mm -hmm. It's unlikely because we're using line drivers, but theoretically it's possible. Um mm -hmm. if that if that was occurring, um over time the zero position would gradually drift, right? Either forwards or backwards, or it might yeah, any which way. And that's gonna change the angle, the efficiency of the FOC, right? Mm -hmm. Um so it event so it's probably something we should implement, but for the durations that we operate at, it's not a big deal. Cool. All right. Any anyone stuff on anything there? Sick. All right. On to the current sense. Um, now, forgive me because this is probably my least uh, the section I'm least across. But um, essentially, we've got on. Remember, if we go back to this picture. We've got the three half bridges. And it, two of the half bridges have these current sense resistors on them, right? Now here they're gray, but in real life they look like copper colored. Um, so that those those current sense resistors are here. Um, so you can see that on the output of the half bridge, um, the the all the current goes through the shunt resistor and then to the out, and that that out actually goes to the connector that goes to the room, right? So all all the current that goes to the motor, say we have one amp going through this wire, it goes through this resistor. Now this resistor is very, very low resistance. In this case, it's 0.7 milliohms. Okay, so if you did the maths, you get your vehicle's IR. So we've got 0.7 milliohms. And say we had 10 amps going across it, that means that we've got a seven millivolt uh seven, yeah, is that right? Yeah, seven millivolt um voltage that we have to detect that, that is generated between these pins two and three. Does that make sense? So the voltage drop across this resistor is seven, seven millivolts if we had. Thank you. We're only looking at one half bridge. Is that right? Yes, this is just one half bridge. Yeah. Yeah. And the actual one half bridge. Yes. Mm -hmm. It goes through the resistor. Um, now, so the thing is, um, so so it's a differential. So there's this. So this chip here is a current sense amplifier. So it takes that very small signal, which is seven million mm -hmm. millivolts, right, mm -hmm. and it amplifies it up into the range that the PIC ADC can detect. Mm -hmm. Um, so 3.1, 3.3 volts is the pick, the pick, well, it should be 3.3 volts. We actually run it at 3.1 volts because of this, um, mm -hmm. which I will try to explain, but I'm probably going to plan that a little bit. Um, the other thing that's at play here 
is that the current sense resistor needs to measure both positive and negative currents, mm -hmm. right? Because the half bridge can both supply and sink current. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that means that the current sense resistor needs to measure. You, you could do the maths, but I think I think the range. I think we've. I think they're designed for thirty amps coil currents. I'm not exactly. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, so you can do the maths and figure out what that corresponds to in voltage. Um, and yeah, so the, the current sense amplifier, it outputs a center voltage, which is that, um, I think it does. Uh, yeah, anyway, so I, you can have a look at the data sheet and the implementation if you're a bit more interested. But all you need to really worry about is that this this current sense amplifier will output uh, 3.1 volts when the current is maximally positive, and it'll output zero volts when the current is maximally negative. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? And that's an analog reading that gets a, that goes to the PIC ABC to be read. Cool. Um, so yeah, so you can see here that there's the current sense resistors and these little chips here with the capacitors, that that's the current sense amplifiers. Mm -hmm. so there's small little guys there. Um, very cool slide I've got here. Um, so the ADCs are configured as 16 bit and they're in differential mode. So the differential mode is uh, what I was talking about where it takes um, the, yeah, so, so there's two, there's the positive and the negative outputs of this. And um, actually, yeah, sorry, what I said before is not quite true. So there's two outputs, and both of those go to the pick. Um, is there a picture? No. Both of those go to the pick, and the pick measures the difference between the voltages mm -hmm. on those lines. So, like, the constant amplifier, the output of that is almost like a essentially line drive. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. Um, so, and the, so when when I say it's in differential mode, this this means that when when one line is higher than the other, the ADC will put out a positive number, and when the other line is higher than when it's the other way around, it'll put out a negative number mm -hmm. corresponding to a negative mm -hmm. number. Right? Um, you can see my red notes for me from me from months ago, where I was like put more stuff on a slide and I didn't. Okay. Um, uh, so you'll notice that. I think I think I might be slightly wrong. I think they're configured as fifteen bit, and that's why we need to bit shift them once. No, sorry, no, that's not true. They are configured as sixteen bit. This is a problem that we haven't been able to figure out. So if you ever figure out where this comes from, uh, you get major brownie points from myself and Christos. There is a problem in the ADC code somewhere, or the configuration, or something, where the currents get read half of what they should. So when you, uh, when it, uh, and this, this was operating all the way up until just before we went to URC and we didn't realize, and that's why we were burning motors so badly at ARC, or part of the reason. It's why actually, it's why we're burning motors, but it also meant that those puny little motors we were using would basically not have been able to driven, drive the pivots at all if we didn't have this uh, mistake in. <laughs> right. So originally that, that bit shift left once was not there, right? And one day we were measuring it and we were going, okay, it's reading this many amps. And we got out the fluke multimeter and we went, yeah, it's reading like half as much as it should. No idea why. Just can't figure it out. Like I said, major brain points to figure it out, but we just doubled it. Problem solved. Um I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the negative um that is a little bit difficult to explain, but it comes from the fact that you need to have um, you need to have the all of the signs and the alignment of the of like the the three half bridge voltages and the alignment of the half bridge current sensors. You need to make sure they're done correctly. Um, and because if they don't align, then you're going to get minus one that's going to spin the wrong way or the field orange control will break and stuff like that. <laughs> Long story short, this is the most elegant solution. Um, and yeah, it's, 
<laughs> we spent and, and actually this is another issue where we realized that the entire time we were running at, at it, I think we figured out both of these bugs on the same day actually um, the voltage vector like the the, di the direct voltage direction and the direct current direction so the the, the so, say you like froze the motor the the direction at which it was measuring the direct current and the direction that it thought it was applying the direct that, that it was applying the direct voltage were not aligned. They were sixty degrees out, hmm. and it didn't actually matter because the control loops were so good that it would apply a negative D voltage to achieve zero D current. Um, but it was really bad, uh, and it was also another gremlin we've been hiding there for ages. We we figured it out because we 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 held the motor stationary and put a fixed current through, and you would expect that the the quadrature current increases to that value and the quadrature voltage follows with it because it's just resistive, right? Because it's stalled. Um, and you would expect that the direct current and the direct voltage stay at zero, right? What we were actually seeing is that the direct current, the quadrature current was going up and the quadrature voltage was going up a bit. The direct current the direct current was at zero, like you'd expect, but the direct voltage was going negative, which makes no sense. And that's because you, we didn't have the correct matching of the current sense with the, the half bridges. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, this is sort of recap, but uh, as we said in the previous workshops, we want to have we want to maximize the force in the quadrature direction. Um, cool. So here's how the current control works. So you can see on the left-hand side, the text is really small, I'm sorry, but it's just what we've got. We've got three imports there. So the first one is current two, then current one, and then angle in. Um, and so angle in is that resolver. Um, this this equation here on the bottom. Um, and the two current sense are these two, right? Current one, current two. So those values get directly piped into the X2C model through these green, these green bubbles. And they go into the, they go into the Clark Park transform. Uh, we have two Jonathan's. <laughs> um, and and this, this Clark Park transform converts those two current sense readings and the angle into the direct and quadrature current. Right. right? Everyone following? Yeah. Cool. Um, then, the, then we get two control loops. So the top control loop is for the direct current, and the bottom control loop is for the quadrature current. Right? So the direct current, we follow that. It goes through this this plus and minus block, so that's like the error block, mm -hmm. right? So we have our reference, which is zero. We want the direct to be zero. We we put that in the plus and we subtract the actual value of d from it, and that gives us the error term, which we feed into the the pi block. Mm -hmm. um, the pi block has a bunch of settings that you can configure. So there's an enable, which is on, right? That's set to one. There's the maximum, so this defines the maximum output that the pi block can output. So if, for example, you didn't want to output more than 95% of your duty cycle, which, which we, we do, and in this case, if, not, if, we don't, if you didn't want to output more than 90% D or Q voltages, then you can configure it to be 90% when they say 0.9, right? And that, and that sets the maximum value uh, to be 0.9. You can also set the minimum to be, in this case, negative 0.9. So everything is plus, plus or minus. Uh, and the way we do that here is just with a minus one gain block so that we can change just the magnitude. You only have to change one variable and that changes everything. Um, then you've got this init. This init is just the start the start value of the output of the PI block. So when it first turns on, what is the PI out block outputting? Uh, the reason why you have that is that um, because of the integral term, that plus C, right, it means that you can have an arbitrary output to start with. So we set that that init to be uh, zero, and that just take P backing up with this. All right, so that error term comes in. We you can double click this PI block to configure the the KP and KI, the, the control system constants, and then it outputs a voltage to adjust the. Uh, so it either increases or decreases the D voltage so that the D current is zero, mm -hmm. and then it's constantly updating. Right, this is happening twenty four thousand times a second. At the same time, we've got the Q voltage, uh, the Q current. So the Q current, exactly the same thing. It goes into this plus minus block. And then there's this command current, this red, this red block. 
Um, so the way that we've configured things is you can you can set what mode this block diagram is operating. So if you can if you set it to operate in the in the velocity sorry in the current current control mode just current not ignoring the velocity loop ignoring the position mode, just current control then you this 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 is a little switch here it's called current velocity switch and it will switch command between either this this command current block or the velocity loop above it does that make sense please say it doesn't <laughs> okay. So, so that that block there, you can you can toggle um, in in code. You can toggle that, and it will. So it means that it will either take the commanded current input from this block, which you can set independently, or it will take it from the the output of the velocity loop running above it. So, if you disabled the velocity loop and you wanted to accelerate the motor, you could set a torque. This isn't really used when we drive the rover, but it's used for like uh, for um, for tuning the control loops. So when you so when you send like hash blah blah five, the the or like O5, what is it? O O one five, the, the five command, that is the current control. So when you whatever you send in the hex of that can command will end up in that. Why not just the desired velocity? That's that's what I'm Okay. The, the, sorry, the desired. Uh, it's, the, it's the out. Sorry, no. It's the output. The output of the velocity loop is current, so it gives in a, a desired current. That's like the current of the velocity loop. Yeah, so it isn't really the output of the loop. No. So the the input of the current loop is a desired current, and it changes the voltage. Oh, the output of the yeah, the, the input of the velocity. Yeah, so the input of the velocity loop is a desired velocity, and the output is a desired current. So is a is a current that will drive you to that. Yeah? yeah, cool. Anyway, so point is, there's that switch. Um, it, you'll see how it plays out later, hopefully. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that 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 com desired current um, from whichever source goes into that plus minus block. You get the error term that goes in exactly the same as the V. And then on the right hand side, these output. Are the, these are the D and Q voltages, and they um, so so they are here now, and they go into the 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 inverse Clark inverse Park space vector modulation block, uh, and and then to the outputs like we talked about the other day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, that's okay. This is a slightly different version of the uh, block diagram to what I showed earlier because this is the one for Pac-Man. Um, the only difference is how the home enabler is, is handled. It's it's basically out of date at this point because that project got killed. Um, but yeah, so anyway, it's a bit clearer to understand. This inverse part is three duty cycles. Yes, to be clear. So the rate the rate limiters they just prevent you from being able to go from essentially zero to 100% duty cycle in one time step because right. we had brown out issues. Yeah. Um, and then finally, the concept is the. Yep, the three duty cycles. So yeah. if you remember from last week, here is where we set this is so we get we get those three values from those app blocks and then we, we have to scale them and bit shift them and stuff to get them to fit properly. But that, that's how that. Sick. All right. Um, so here's an example of what it looks like when you're actually running control it uh, with current. So you can see it's, it's a lot noisier than like the hypothetical example we gave, but um, yeah, it's still it's it works sort of exactly how you'd expect. So that that yellow line is the target current, and we so we apply we we set a, a target current and. The control loop goes, okay, I want to increase the Q current in order to, uh, so I want to increase the, the Q voltage so that I can increase the Q current. So it, it does that. Um, and it and it does that quite aggressively, right? So the, the Q voltage actually clips at the 95% limit. Um, I think on the previous slide, it might've been 90%. That's probably an out of date picture. Um, so clips at the 95% limit and then sort of oscillates around. That oscillation is like fine, because if you look at a time scale, this is one millisecond. Mm. 
right? So it takes like obviously there's like a lot of readings because I'm running the control loop so fast. But this is one millisecond of oscillation, which is fine. And then it, and then the Q, and then you can see that this is sort of the P term of the PI controller where it suddenly spikes up because there's this huge error. And you can see it sort of stabilizes like here. And then you can see the I term take over and it and it gradually pulls the error to steady state on the target current. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. And then the, you can see exactly the same thing's happening at the D voltage. And you get sort of this weird, this weird behavior, right? When you first turn it on, the D voltage sort of gets a bit of a weird kick. Um, but long term and like for, it, for any important uh, intent, it's it's zero constant, which is great. And also the D voltage, which means that it's not properly mapped. So previously, when, when things were not behaving properly, this D voltage was going wildly negative in order to supply zero D current, which doesn't make any intuitive sense. Um, and yeah, this is with a locked rotor, right? So the rotor's not spinning. Obviously, if you had, if the rotor was spinning and you apply a, a constant current, it's going to accelerate, which means that this voltage is going to have to keep increasing in order to maintain a constant current. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we talked about last week. Cool. So that's field oriented control. Here's a video of what it looks like if it loads. Oh. There. So that that like kick that you heard when it suddenly slowed down, that's because um it reached it essentially reached saturation in the in the voltage loop. So it, it reached like the maximum voltage it could apply at that speed, and that caused some like unst instability in the control loop. This is also with that previous version of the code, which had the error in the alignment. So that might have been another factor as well. But anyway, so you can you can see that it goes really freaking fast, mm. um, and you can see that. But based on what I've explained earlier, you you get the expected behavior where you apply a constant torque, and so this is just applying constant current, right? So you're applying small constant current, and it's accelerating up. And then it saturates at the maximum speed it can do. And then we apply a negative current and it, it breaks it down to zero quite quickly and then accelerates it the other way. Um, cool. So yeah, that's field and control. That's that's the hard bit done, basically. Um, oh yeah, here's oh yeah, this is so this is the this is the slide that I was talking about earlier where we've got to match them all properly. Um, and in fact you can even see that it's it's out of date because we don't have the negatives here and the and the bit shift. Um, apologies that some of these code snippets are out of date. Uh, and you can also see that there's like a bit of a weird order of these, like we go three, seven, five, UBW. We had to switch these, we had to switch five and seven to get it to match correctly as well. Uh, but anyway, this is, it's sort of a solved problem now. We know how they, how they match together. Um, but this is something you've also got to consider. Um, so the way you tell that it's right is by doing a locked weather test and checking that the D and Q voltage and currents are doing what you expect. Uh, sick. All right. <laughs> Lol. Okay. We're clearly getting out of my preparation of slides. Uh, so I don't have a video of this, but I do have a text that says put the video here. <laughs> um, so um, now we're moving on to velocity control. So this is how do we, so we need to, we want to reach a specific target velocity and we need to adjust the Q current to reach that velocity. Um, in order to do that, we need to A, have a way of applying a desired Q current, which we've solved. We've, we've done that. That's good on control, all sorted. We also need a way of measuring the velocity of the motor. So how do we do that? So that is the also using the encoder. So um, you can always code. It's a bit yuck. I will admit that. Um, it's all bundled up into this QEI get velocity function. Um, and essentially, there's this term called the, that we've dubbed the so the, the min interval is if the motor is a is it's a constant and it depends on the motor um, and it's essentially 
how many clock cycle, what's the minimum number of clock cycles that can happen between two pulses of the encoder if the motor is spinning at full speed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because now the reason we need to know that is because that defines the maximum speed in software land, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't you can't have any interval that's slower than that. No. Um yeah. Sorry, yeah, smaller than that. Yeah. So we we get this min interval and then we do this yucky division thing, um, which is it turns it into this thing called a velocity factor. Um, and that is essentially you take the velocity reading from, sorry, you take the interval from, from the QEI interface and you multiply it by the velocity factor. And that gives you a speed that ranges from negative 16,000 to positive 16,000. Okay. So you can see, um, Oh, yeah, in this else, the velocity equals, okay, it's a bit more complicated. Seven FFF divided by the interval times the velocity factor, right? So I just have to trust me that the maths works out. I can, you can figure it out. Basically, you need the number of pulses per revolution, the number of, the maximum RPM of the motor, and the number of clock cycles per second of the CPU. And that will give you this velocity factor. And, and you'll kind of get an intuition for how these work. Um, there's a bunch of catches in here. So this, um, this first one, so this velocity low, velocity high is, like I was saying before, they're two, two 16 bit halves of the same 32 bit number. Um, and you need to read VEL1 count in order to populate VEL1 hold. It's just a weird quirk. So we, we read it and then we do nothing with it. And so this first this first catch and and these are signed right. So if the if the, if you get an A before B pulse, it's positive. You get a B before A pulse. It's negative. Um, so if both of them are zero, that means that there hasn't been an encoder step in the time we were looking, which I, is probably pretty unlikely just with like random noise. But it's a it's a catch that we've got. So if if, if there's no if the speed is zero, that means it hasn't been a pulse, which means just don't do anything. Okay. Um, if the Int high is not zero, so the the top half of the int of the interval register is not zero. That means that the motor it, it's taken so long to go from one edge of the quadrature signal to the next edge of the quadrature signal that over sixteen thousand uh, clock cycles have accumulated, and we just approximate that as zero speed because, for our intents and purposes, it is. It's so it's very very slow. Um, I think I think that's valid. Yeah, it's, it's so large that the speed is approximately zero. It shouldn't be possible since there are only ever four thousand clock cycles per ADC loop. Uh, and I've got to do send warning, but we never do it. And then it sets the velocity to zero. Um, if the interval is less than the min interval, something's gone wrong because the motor is spinning faster than our theoretical fastest min interval, smallest min interval, right? So if that happens, then we set the velocity to be 7 FFF, because if you pump that into this function, you'll get a number greater than 16,000, and it'll break. And then lastly, um, we check this VEL high register. If the velocity, the first bit of the VEL high register is 1, that means that the number is negative, and so then we multiply the velocity by 1. Um, yeah, so the, these velocity registers, I can't remember why we don't use them, but they don't they don't do what we want properly. I can't remember why it might be to do with resolution, um, but yeah, you can have a look at the data sheet for that. We use the interval, yeah, the number of clock cycles between pulse edges. Yeah. Cool. Um, Wait, so the encoders are they are meant to have a functionality. Velocity. Not the encoders, the QEI interface. Oh, okay. On the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and they do. Those those registers do work. Um, I just don't there's a reason why we don't use them. It's probably to do with the resolution of the speed or something like that. Oh. It's just easier to do it this way. Cool. All right, so here's velocity control. Um sorry it's such a low res image, I don't know why. Um but we've got this velocity in port, which um, I haven't shown you here, but this this 
all, basically this function gets called uh, eight once every eight control cycles. So so we we, we update the control loop every like, every single time, and then every eighth current. Sorry, we update the we update the current loop once every eight every single cycle, and then every eight of those cycles we update the velocity. And that's to do with control system stability. You essentially need enough time for your inner controller to stabilize before you change the input again. Otherwise, you'll get oscillations and horrible things. Um, so, so that function gets called and it gets piped into the struct that contains the imports, uh, just like just like it does the other one. Um, this the struct like these ones. How we how we this this XGC model import struct. So the code is exactly the same. It's just imports dot b velocity in or something equals and it's the return of that function. Okay. This function. Um, so it takes in rotor velocity, it outputs a Q current, right? So rotor velocity is in here, and then this this line here is the, the Q current. Um, now there's a lot of smoothing here, averaging and smoothing. This probably isn't as needed anymore. And I think it's actually been deaggressed a lot as we developed the systems. Um, these were partly to deal with weird instability that we couldn't understand. And we and and that was likely due to that mismatch of the current sense alignment with the with the half bridge alignment like I was doing that before. Anyway, there's a so this is just a, an averaging filter. So it takes it takes the readings from this and averages over the eight cycles and I might run over four according to here. And then there's a low pass filter that removes anything above 400 hertz in 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 C. Um, again, I think that these numbers may have changed, so check the code. But like before, we get this 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 imp, this target velocity coming in off the left of the page, and and that has that can either be configured to be a set velocity or be from the output of the position loop. So obviously for the drive, they're just set to the the set velocity. For the pivots, that that velocity is driven by the by the position loop, um, and then we got the gets turned into an error term. It goes into the input. We've got the limits. So here we act, we're actually limited to half the maximum speed that it can do. Um, that might also be out of date. And then the enable. Um, excuse these wonky arrows. That's just a quirk of um, Xcos. It just sometimes likes doing that to your arrows for some reason. Everyone understand this? Um, and again, we can configure the PI constants in, in that block to tune it how we want. What does it mean to take half the maximum speed? So, the, do you know what the funk? Do you know what the equation for a PI loop is? Um, so, yep. Yeah, correct. Exactly right. So that's what it does. That's that's what that block does. So it takes the integral of the error, multiplies by ki, takes the error, multiplies by kp, adds them together, outputs outputs that. And it, but it also clips it. It also clips it to the minimum maximum that's allowed. So um, that means the uh, q current is um, proportional to the loss. It's proportional to the error. Okay. And the integral here. Well, you can see that in action here, right? So <clears throat> a bit more going on, but you can see uh, also we have uh it's not shown, but we have a ramp on the target velocity to prevent it again from from going from desired zero speed to desired max speed like in, in a millisecond. So you can see we ramp over. It's about a hundred mils. It, it's a it's it's a it's a maximum slope. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the actual value. Is, but you get the picture. Um, so province integrating one. Yeah, yeah. So you can see. Um, so as it starts, like sort of down here, as it's as it's increase, as the velocity set point is increasing. The, the velocity loop is going, huh, okay, I'm too slow. The blue line is smaller than my yellow line. Let's increase the current. So it increases the current. And the current is essentially constant over this period because it's accelerating linear, right? So that's, that's good. That's sort of what we expect. And then the velocity reaches the, the set point. 
um, and then it pulls the current back down again to roughly zero. Now you can see that it's not it's not exactly zero, and that's because of friction, right? So it needs some small amount of torque to overcome friction to keep it spinning at that speed. Um, but more or less, it's it's zero, which is good. We also see that it, it doesn't actually take a lot of current to accelerate. And it, this is obviously a free spinning motor, so the more load you have, the, the greater the torque requirement. But but for a free spinning motor, it only takes like fifteen percent of the current we can supply to to spin it up to seventy five percent of the speed, um, which is pretty quick. You can also see, as we expect, as we increase the velocity, the voltage increases. And you can see here that it is exactly linear, right? which is pretty cool. You actually get to see that that velocity voltage relation plus plus this little this little difference that comes from the, the resistor tab. Right? Um, yeah. Any questions there? Make sense? Cool. Um, in order to tune the velocity control loop, um, yeah, you essentially want to apply Q current to the set point and avoid overshoot. Um, so we 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 very gently tune this this loop. We haven't. It's not it's not nearly as aggressive as the current control was, right? Where the, the voltage literally clipped instantly and then went back down again. Um, and a lot more gentle because we don't need it to be exactly at the right speed within within an instant. But it, it still gets like it gets to the speed within a tenth of a second, which is still not really quick. Mm. Um. Cool. Now on to position control. So this is the last one. Um, exactly the same deal as last time. We have the output position in, which comes from by by talking to the resolver. Um, now the, obviously this is just for the pivots. So the output position in. Ignore this gain five point five for now. I'll explain it in a moment. Um, and also all of this gain as well. I'll explain that in a moment. <laughs> this stuff is really gross. Uh, but anyway, um, yep. So, and, and you can see this is the rate limiter I was talking about. So the, the rate limiter, uh, oh, sorry, no, that's the position rate limiter. There's another one just off screen here in between here that, that rate limits the velocity change. We talk to the AMT21 over RS rate five, um, through the, and that's through the chatlets, right? So if you want the full architecture. Um, yeah, so if you ignore the gains, it's exactly the same as the other one. It's, you know, error goes in, PI constants, perfect. Now, here's the quirks. So there's there's a couple of issues, um, not issues, but things you've got to be aware of with the position loop. The first thing is that the resolver is in a three to two ratio for the actual position, right? So nine, uh, so like half a revolute, half a, half a, yeah, so ninety degrees rotation on the result on the on the output of the pivot corresponds to one hundred and thirty five degrees measured on the resolver, right? So everything's scaled up by fifty percent. Um, so we scale so any any position that is read by the resolver gets scaled down by 0.75 so that uh, sorry, <laughs> slightly different. We scale any commanded position up by point, sorry, no, down by point. Yeah, 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 that's right. Scale anything down so that 135 degrees out of a possible 180 on the resolver corresponds to 90 degrees on the pivot. So, um, because so like, let me work it backwards. So so the maximum pivot angle we ever need to do is plus my plus or minus ninety degrees, right? That corresponds to one hundred and thirty five degrees on the resolver. Yeah, and out of a possible plus or minus one hundred and eighty degrees on the resolver, right? Is that is that a feature? Yeah, the resolvers only do one one turn. Yep. So, so the resolvers can only show plus or minus 180 degrees, mm -hmm. and the pivots can only move plus or minus 90 degrees, mm -hmm. which means that the the full range of values that we can command out of the resolver is 135 degrees of that 100. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So 135 degrees 
of the 180 degree positive range is 0.75. Okay. Right. That's so we're three quarters of the full range of the resolver. So if we want the resolver to go to plus 90, if we didn't scale anything, we would have to send it 0.75. Right? We would we would say go to aim, go to 0.75 of your full range. Because otherwise it would overshoot and it would go to yeah. further than that. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we scale down all the commands by multiplying by 0.75 so that one like plus one position corresponds to plus 90 degrees and minus one position corresponds to negative. Ignore the diagram at the bottom for now. That's not that's coming next. Okay, does that does that make sense? Right. So we're, essentially, we just have to scale all the commanded all the commanded positions by 0.75 so that when we send it one, it goes to positive ninety. When we send it minus one, it goes to negative. And that 0.75 comes from the fact that the resolver is acting in 135 out of 100. What do you mean by we send one to what? To the position loop. So, like this input, this command position, um, it before we put it in there, like in the code, before we put it in there, we multiply it by 0.75. So that. So if I want to go to 90 degrees for the for the final output, obviously, mm -hmm. I times it by 0.75. Yeah. Yeah. So and that 0.75 would become that 90 degree corresponds to 135 degree on the resolver, and which is 0.75 proportion of the full range of the Bang. Yep. Uh, yep. Nice. That's a good explanation, too. All right. So that's the first part. <laughs> the second part is what all these games do. Um, so now the other quirk of the position loop is that. If you have so th this this represents like the um, like the range of the the pivot. So this actually corresponds to the range of the resolver, right? So it can be plus or minus one hundred thirty five degrees. Now, as far as as far as the control system is concerned, the pivot angle doesn't matter. Like it doesn't know what ninety degrees pivot is. It only knows what plus or minus one hundred thirty five degrees resolver. Is. Now, if you were at minus one hundred thirty five degrees. And he, then you commanded it to go to plus 135 degrees. Uh, what does it do? It tries to go up. Correct. It, yeah, it goes the wrong way. It goes It goes through this disallowed region. Now, there's probably other ways of doing this, but uh, me and Christos are very creative. And our solution was just crunch the range down into half of the allowed range. So minus 62.5 plus 62.5. And it's only got one just one choice on which way for any any ingenious. There you go. Sure. <laughs> um, so essentially, what we do is we scale down all of the commanded positions by 0.5, and we scale down all of the measured positions by 0.5. And then, as far as the control is concerned, it can only go in this range. Okay. And that's where these numbers come from. So this 0.5 here is us scaling it down by 0.5, and this 0.375 is 0.75 from here divided by two. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why that number, whenever I see that number, I'm like, where did this come from? <laughs> what the hell is going on? And that's where it came from. So you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just to add a comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could. Um, anyway. So, um, yeah. Now there's this, there's one more quick, and I'm not going to go into detail, but uh you can th this switch here this encoder resolver switch it this this block diagram actually lets you do position control on the motor side if you want to now we can only do position control within an electrical cycle that's a bit shit uh but but it, it can do that so if you want it for whatever reason that, that, is, that is an option and that's what that switch is between so you can switch the input to be that and then you can run it that way. but it's not tuned for that so just be aware. It's sort of a it's an old feature, and uh, I think we should get rid of it. But Chris doesn't want to. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, cool. Well, there you go. So there's all the quirks. Now you understand it. And so this is what the position loop looks like when it's run. You can first thing you should notice is that the timeline is a lot longer. Massive flight. So when it takes us about 800 milliseconds to reach the target position, um, which is still pretty quick. Like our target was a second for for 
um, going forward and backwards, so that's good. Um, and so you can see that, you know, where down here, the position is like way too low. We're not, we're not moving that. So it needs to, up, so it increases the velocity so that it starts to move, right? And to increase the velocity, it needs to increase the current. Okay, so it increases the current and then the velocity sort of flattens out. So the current kind of falls closer to zero and it just has to overcome friction. Mm -hmm. We've got this positive velocity. So the, the motor's moving, the pivot's moving. And then as the pivot approaches the set point, um, at, at this point where things start to fall off, that's when the proportional part of the PI loop is like saturated. It's like tapped. And then, and then the integral part takes over. And that's why it sort of winds down towards the end. And then you can see actually that um, it, it actually applies a negative Q current here to slow the motor down faster. Wow. So it actually ramps up and back down again to, to reach the desired position. And that's not something that like we've programmed in. That's just like because of the behavior of control loops, it just does that, um, which is really cool. And once again, you can see here that our voltage is lovely and linear with our voltage. We sort of get that. Get that uh, <laughs> lovely behavior. Oh boy, code. Here we go. Um, <laughs> you'll notice a couple of expletives in here. Um, <laughs> the, the resolver code is a bit nightmarish. <laughs> Very nightmarish. So, first off, in so in this XGC, so if you remember back to last last week, I'll go. I'll go back to this slide. Um, all the way back here, uh, here, right? This is the program flow. Oh, that's really for a uh, and so we have this this main in in here, and and then there's this interrupt that gets called where XGC update and X and update outputs gets called, right? Mm. So inside that, uh, and uh, so there's the update imports which gets the values from all the imports. There's the XGC update, which propagates through the model. And then there's the update outputs, which um, sets the values in the, in the output. So if we go back to yeah. So in this, <clears throat> in, the, in the update imports function um, is, this, is this code. So if has resolver, so as resolver is just a, a Boolean that is true if it's a pivot, basically, or false if it's not, right? So this code won't run on the wheel mm -hmm. that the girl um, it, if So if it has a resolver, it will turn, uh, it will set the encoder resolver switch to be one. That's that's the thing I was talking about where you can do position control with the, with the motor side if you wanted to. So that sets it to be resolver position control. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't ever set it to be uh, you you could, but yeah, we we don't use that function. But in theory, you could have it drive it to to zero position, and that might be a better if your traction was really good on your wheels. That might be a, a a more responsive way of holding a position on a slope than a zero speed control. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. so um, essentially, so so remember how before I was saying that the velocity loop runs every eight cycles, well, the position loop runs every sixty four cycles, right? Because it's relative to the current. Yeah, relative to the current. So, so, it, so the position loop runs every eight velocities, right? And these these numbers are a little bit arbitrary, but on the fiftieth velocity loop, yeah. it it will request the angle from the resolver, and on the sixty second velocity loop, it will check that the response is there and process the data. Okay, that makes sense. So, it's, yeah. so that polls it says, "Hey, give me give me the information." In the in in the intervening twelve loops, the resolver is responding with the data, and then it gets the data and processes it. So in this request angle, all we do is uh, essentially clear the clear the RX buffer, the receive buffer, um, just to be safe, and write the data that we want. The, write the command. The OX54 is like, hey resolver, what's your what's your angle? Yeah. And then and then that that happens in the background. And then this process angle is um, a nightmare, but very important. Essentially, there's a, an ongoing problem, which I still don't know the reason why, where sometimes the resolver will receive more than two bytes. Sorry, sometimes the pick will receive more than two bytes from the resolver. 
yeah. even though it's only meant mm-hmm. to get two. So and and those those other bytes are like always like empty, and it's I think it's to do with how the RTS pin on the resolver works and like how what that appears on the output of the transceiver like. But anyway, yeah, this is this is this is here. Um, so essentially, this this R this UX URXBE is like um, while there's data in the in the buffer to read, it reads it into this data array. And if the number of bytes in that data array are three, that means that it's picked up one byte at the start, which is empty, and then two bytes of actual data. And that's just I just discovered this through trial and error, basically. So if that's the case, then the low byte is the first, not the zero byte, and the high byte is the second, not the, not the first byte. If there's two bytes, then it reads it as it normally would. Um, and and then it, now else, um, this basic, in, in Christos's lovely language, means that it didn't respond, mm. right? Or, or like it's responded with like five bytes, like somehow, or something like that, like something bizarre. Um, we increment this fault counter, right? And if the fault counter, so if it goes through 20 loops and the fault counter increments each time, then it raises a resolver fault flag. Um, and then that flag appears on the canvas. Published in this resolver. So, if, for example, if the resolver is unplugged, or if you plug your, <laughs> and like at URC this year, if you plug your pivot motor CMVs into the wrong slots and it can't talk to the resolver, it will give you this flag because it can't find them. Um, yep. And then lastly, it, um, let me just check some. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out what it's called. Um, weird. Uh, anyway, the at some point the checksum function is called. This is how it works. It's based off of this stack overflow thing. Um, it works really. It's kind of cool. There was a whole Slack thread where we just <laughs> we designed this thing. Um, and essentially, if the checksum fails, uh, similar similar thing. It increments counters and then will send a fault flag. Um, actually, yeah, I think this might be out of date. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, and yeah, so yeah, the RTS pin causes phantom rising edges, which the UI then reads as the start of the fight. But it's and that's why you get those zero. That's why you get those extra zero. Um, if you send, uh, yeah, and there's there's code that isn't here. But if you send O like three eight, that will zero resolver three. Cool. All right, my leave it there.